You've been asking for it. So here it comes. Today, we're talking parenting, positive, strength-based. What do I do next? My kids of all ages, heck, even my adult kids are driving me nuts kind of parenting. If you've heard previous episodes, you've definitely heard me talk about it. But today, I am going to try and dig deep into the Nurtured Heart approach to parenting and how it will help you feel more sanity in your parenting, in your life. I'll show you why having a solid parenting platform is so important to work from and how to implement this approach into your parenting today, like in an hour or so when you're done listening to this episode. So let's get to this episode of The Virtual Couch. Hey, so today's episode deals with finding the right fit in therapy. And my guest, Rachel Nielsen, who is host of the popular podcast, 3 and 30 Takeaways for Moms, is going to talk about some of the challenges that she had in finding the right therapist. Now, as a therapist myself, I, of course, recommend that everybody give therapy a try. I mean, truly, we're all hanging on to some things that would maybe be helpful to process, or there are things in our life that we maybe thought we would achieve by now, or things that we desperately want to achieve so that we won't live a life full of regrets. Or there are people listening right now who might be noticing that their anxiety or their depression is getting a tiny bit more. If it's like me, you can go listen to a couple episodes I did on this. I started recognizing that I I had ADHD and I needed to deal with it. Um, but, But let's just say that some of these things get a tiny bit amplified, maybe the longer they're left untreated. Well, I think you owe it to yourself or to those around you, your spouse, your kids. And I mean, honestly, if I'm being uh, honest, which I just said twice, you owe it to yourself, to you, to very, at the very least, give therapy a try. So if you're nervous about finding the right fit with a therapist, or if you're worried about bumping into somebody in the waiting room, which I totally understand, if you have any worries about therapy, might I recommend that you go immediately to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. Again, that's betterhelp.com forward slash virtual couch, all one word. And take a look at the world of online therapy. I mean, there are 500,000 people and growing who have already who have already done this, of so going through to betterhelp.com. They have a broad range of expertise in their counselor network, which might not be available locally in many areas. Uh, the service is available for clients worldwide. If you're even out of the country, you can find, uh, find a therapist uh, online. You can log into your account anytime. You can send a message to your counselor, and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't ever have to sit in these uncomfortable waiting rooms as with traditional therapy. And the BetterHelp.com assessment is what is pretty impressive. They'll assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And if you're looking for a particular modality, I love acceptance and commitment therapy. I love emotionally focused therapy. You will find therapists who excel or they have areas of expertise in those areas if you're struggling with OCD. Um, anxiety, depression, I mean, you name it. They have therapists there. You can start communicating with a therapist sometimes in, in as little as under 24 hours. And uh, BetterHelp.com is also, um, it, it just has these great therapeutic matches. And they also, uh, it makes it easy to change counselors. And they do have, um, <laughs> what's the word? Where they give you a discount? Um, financial aid. They also have financial aid if you need it. So if you do, go to BetterHelp. Uh, just again, go to BetterHelp.com slash virtual couch. And you'll receive 10% off your first month services. So what are you waiting for? You owe it to yourself at the very least to just check it out. So go ahead, pause the podcast, do it right now. I'm not going anywhere and uh, give it a shot. Betterhelp.com slash virtual couch. Um, you owe it to yourself uh, to, to, to process some of these things, um, uh, but give it a shot. And uh, now let's get to the podcast. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneurs on Fire, the award-winning podcast for busy people who want to ignite. I grew my business to more than $15 million with podcasting, and now you can too. Visit oxbus.com to get started with the fastest, easiest way to build your business using the power of your voice. No audio experience necessary. That's oxbus.com, A-U-X-B-U. US dot com and start for free today. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to episode 167 of the Virtual Couch. I'm your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father for ultra marathon runner and creator of the path back an online pornography recovery program that is helping people reclaim their lives from the harmful effects of pornography i always told uh, i've had a couple people tell me that they can memorize this or they can say this right along with me so 
Sorry if I just threw you off. If you or somebody that you know is struggling to put pornography behind you once and for all, and trust me, it can be done, how? In a strength-based, hold the shame, become the person you always knew you could be way, then please head over to pathbackrecovery.com. There you can download a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to get rid of pornography once and for all. Again, that's pathbackrecovery.com. And please visit Virtual Couch on Instagram. I'm kind of heating up there. I have a couple of amazing interns that are helping me out behind the scenes, doing weekly question and answers, uh, typically midweek, as well as a little Instagram TV. So please follow along there. And you can find the Virtual Couch page on Facebook, as well as the Tony Overbay Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist Facebook page. Go like them both. Why not? And if you have a minute and have enjoyed any of the Virtual Couch podcast material, um, I would be ever grateful. Um, hey, my birthday is coming up in a couple of weeks. Do me uh, for my birthday. If you could, uh, re- <laughs> if you could review the uh, the podcast or uh, subscribe, um, rate, review, and if you send me a screenshot or let me know about that, I still have some path or no, what do I? Uh, virtual couch magnet stickers, that sort of thing. I would love to throw one in the mail for you. So again, uh, I don't know. I've turned fifty in a couple of weeks here, so that would be fantastic. There's my birthday present. Um, just kind of thought of that one. And please. Uh, Head over to TonyOverbay.com. I'm sharing a lot more about some programs and podcasts and and a little bit more release information on the book that I co-authored with Joshua Shea. And uh, I know I keep saying this, but um, the pre-release buzz is uh, just, man, uh, humbling. You, um, it's, uh, it's really nice to hear that I think this book is going to fit a need. The book is called He's a Porn Addict, Now What? An Expert and a Former Addict Answer Your Questions. And I play the role of the expert and former virtual couch guest Josh Shea who's already authored a best-selling book called The Addiction Nobody Will Talk About. He writes as The Addict, and uh, I'll have the link in the show notes of where you can go to pre-order the book. And But it really, the I didn't read any of Josh's answers to the questions. We were both posed a lot of questions. And uh, it really, reading his answers, I mean, I'm kind of, I, I just got hooked on that for a couple of days. And just to hear, he just really does, I was going to say, he does an amazing job portraying The Addict because, I mean, that that was what he, he is, you know, he struggled with pornography addiction, compulsive sexual behavior for a long time. And I just feel like uh, he just gives a lot of insight. I've worked with, uh, I don't know, 11, 1,200 pornography or compulsive sexual behavior addicts. And, uh, and you know, sometimes you think you've, you, you kind of know what the, the mind of somebody that really struggles with uh, pornography addiction or compulsive sexual behavior looks like. And then Josh just really gives it a lot more depth. So I'm, I appreciate that. But let's get to today's podcast. This is one that uh, I have a couple of episodes that are already out there, and I've been interviewed by on this topic, the Nurtured Heart Approach, a parenting approach, on a few other podcasts. And so there's plenty of material there, and I'll probably link to all of those as well. But th- here's the funny thing about, uh, what, 167 episodes in. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I have people all the time tell me, hey, I don't listen to all the episodes of your podcast, and I don't blame you. I mean, there's so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of episodes, and there's a lot of breadth there. You've got everything from... You know, a couple of weeks ago, I did psychopaths, sociopaths, and narcissists. Uh, oh my! I actually took the oh my out of the title, but the the feedback on that one. I mean, I didn't expect that. But I mean, you've got uh, talking about sociopaths and psychopaths, and then a week later, you've, you're talking about parenting, and uh, maybe a couple of weeks before, we're talking about marriage therapy, and you know, we've been talking about anxiety, depression. I know that there's uh, maybe it doesn't fit for everybody. So I I wanted to do another episode on the nurtured heart approach parenting because. A couple of weeks ago, I had good friend, fellow therapist, um, Becky Hennessy on to talk about the love and logic parenting approach. And I, I honestly wasn't familiar with love and logic. And I would often have people, when I would talk about nurtured heart, they would tell me that they're love and logic trained or love and logic approved. And I was told that there's a lot of similarities there. And in interviewing Becky, I felt like there were. And uh, But I will be completely honest, I mean, because everybody can have their own opinion or have different parenting modalities or parenting paradigms. And, uh, and I was, I really enjoyed a lot of what she said. There was some stuff toward the end where, um, that I know is a love and logic methods that Becky's so well trained in. And I thought, I thought they differed a little bit from the nurtured heart approach. And so I didn't want to sabotage the, uh, the interview because I thought it was just so good. And again, I've had amazing feedback from that one too. Um, especially people that are coming into my office, some of the clients that I see that heard that and, and uh, they said that it's really made a difference for them. But I just felt like I, I didn't want to say at the end of that one, oh, well, Becky, you know, Nurtured Heart does this or Nurtured Heart does that. So it just, it just, I thought it would be a good time to do another episode on the Nurtured Heart approach. So if you're looking for some parenting advice or parenting tips, that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to try to go into a little bit more detail on some of the different aspects of the Nurtured Heart approach. So, so let me just start by just kind of giving a little overview. So the, the Nurture Heart Approach was developed by a man named Howard Glasser, and it was in the early 1990s. And it kind of came out of uh, this, this need for helping therapists who are working with families with very intense children. 
And as a matter of fact, the book that I still love that talks about the Nurtured Heart Approach is called Transforming the Difficult Child, A Nurtured Heart Approach by Howard Glasser. And, uh, and it, was, it, it had so much success. And I talk about a lot of the data in one of the earlier podcast episodes. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, list a, I'll put a link to in the show notes to the Nurtured Heart Approach website, which has all of the data. So I'll kind of skip that data part right now. But, uh, but it was so successful that then it started being used in a variety of uh, settings such as schools and, uh, you know, churches, um, foster homes, uh, in, in, in therapy offices. And, and just it had a lot of success so you just saw it implemented more and more places. And, and the, thought, the part that I thought was pretty fascinating is the data behind how it has helped in schools. And, uh, I mean, it's helped um, with behavioral issues. It's helped with uh, even teacher retention, I think, because having this nurtured heart approach helps teachers feel like they have some control in the classroom and, and they're seeing a lot more success. And it really helps with a lot of, uh, I mean, troubled, troubled kids, difficult children, as well as just it's a great way to parent. So troubled kids, meaning everything from I've uh, I've kind of done a little bit of research on it with um, ADHD, with oppositional defiant disorder. Um, so you know some of the really difficult things to deal with. And you know I, I just kind of want to give uh, I'm going to go over the approaches. They have these different approaches or stances. I want to give a few examples of that. And I just kind of want to lay the groundwork. Whenever I talk about nurtured heart approach, I like to start by saying. That just to give a little bit of a background, I get to work with a lot of teenagers, and I'm a father now of uh, not now, been a father for a long time, but I still have two two teenagers left, three, um, uh, one daughter. I think will you know she I think she'll be 20 in another month or so. I've got one that's 21, going to be 22 soon, but I still have a 15 and a 17 year old, and so I, I've used the nurtured heart approach for years. And so again, if you I will stop saying that if you've listened to other episodes, you may have heard these stories before. But I will tell the when I was a, a early, a brand new therapist, I had only been working for a year or two. I was working at a nonprofit and I was at a training and I was sitting there and I had a, at the time I had a pen and some paper. Now I would hopefully have my iPad and my Apple pencil, but I was sitting there waiting. I was there by myself. I didn't really know. I mean, I knew a few people, but I, I think I was just kind of uh, sitting there by myself, maybe doodling. And there was a lady that came up to me and she just, uh, I don't know if I've now made this into a bigger story than, than it was. I mean, I was going to say she put her hand on her on my shoulder, looked deeply into my eyes. I don't think that was the case. But I think she just walked by and, and uh, just smiled, said hi. And I said hi. And I didn't know who she was. And she just said, man, look at you. You're, you're ready to go. You're ready to learn. And I just thought to myself, oh, that's right, I am. Yeah, I'm taking this stuff seriously. You know? And so then when I saw her go up and she was the woman giving the presentation, I even felt more validated. I was like, all right, I'm ready to learn. And then she even said, she said, uh, hey, so a uh, few of you in the, around the room, I went up to and I said um, some comments like, look at you ready to, ready to learn, or you sure look prepared, or I bet you're going to be, you're a great therapist, or that sort of thing, because it, because it looks like you really want to pay attention. And, it, and I, got, I was like, oh, man, I got totally set up. But I, uh, but I really appreciated what she was saying, because when she said those nice words, I really did feel validated. And I just felt, uh, I felt like I was, I was ready. I was locked in. I was ready to learn. And she pointed out that she had gone around and said to a few other people, you know, how many of you did I go up to and just say, hey, good job. And there were a couple of people that kind of had puzzled looks like uh, me, I think, maybe. And that was where she started just introducing this concept of just, you know, energizing this, this good behavior or building this inner wealth and, and doing it with kind of specific phrases or pointing out specific things that people are doing and not just saying, hey, good job, buddy, you know, because the good job thing kind of just goes right over, uh, right over our kids' heads over time, especially um, when that's something that that's all they're hearing. But if you're kind of, uh, you know, building or building this inner wealth or kind of energizing this positivity by pointing out the, look at you with your pen and paper ready to learn, you know, I bet you're, uh, I bet you really care about your clients. You know, you do, you kind of get filled with these feel good you know, chemicals. I mean, and you're just, you're ready, you're more active, you're more, you pay more attention. So that was my first experience with it. And since that time, uh, I've, just, I've just been just all in on the Nurtured Heart approach, both at home and with my kids. And also, I really feel like it's a technique that you can use just in your daily life. It's not about just a parenting technique. I kind of feel like this is a life technique. So, so that's kind of where I like to start. I also always say that when I'm worked with teenagers as a therapist, you know, I, I, I really i am not a big all or nothing statement guy. But I feel pretty safe in saying that I think pretty much all the teenagers that come in will say that, you know, their parents will say, hey, you can come to me with anything. But then if they failed, I would say if they failed a class or if they wrecked the car, if they've been you know, get caught smoking pot or something, and they go to their parent, 
and they say that, then all of a sudden the parent explodes. And so then what happens, and, and again, we're human as parents, and we'll get to that in a little bit here. But what happens is now the teenager becomes kind of this um, protector of data. You know, now, now they're going to really watch what they say. Because now they're not exactly confident that they really can go and tell their parent anything. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. I'm not saying that parents are not allowed to react because we're human. But so what I, again, I love about the Nurtured Heart approach, it is a strength-based modality. It's not something where you're, you're kind of telling somebody, here's all the bad things you're doing and I hope you can learn from it. You're, you're telling them, hey, here's the things that I, I see that are good in you and here's the things that I, I feel like you do well and here's the things that uh, I want to point out to you that I appreciate and, uh, and that's that nurturing, this good behavior, or building inner wealth. And, uh, and I truly believe, and this is something, again, I'm going to pull my therapist card here, but I truly believe that so much of the issues that we're dealing with as parents boil down to feeling like we need to motivate by fear or by shame or that every moment needs to be this teaching moment or lecture. And that might work at times in the short term, but I, I really, I've, I feel strongly saying, I promise you that it does not lead to, to a long-term relationship with your child. And I will, and, and I really have met with a lot of people, especially adults, if, if, if they're coming to me wanting parent training, and I'm talking about this nurtured heart approach where I, I can just hear it over and over again, where somebody will say, hey, my parents were really strict and firm with me, and I turned out okay. And, uh, and I don't mean this to sound negative, but a lot of times I'll say, oh, well, hey, I'm, I'm glad, I'm grateful that that works for you or that worked for you. Um, what's, your, what's your relationship like with your parent today? And uh, sometimes if, I, if, they get, if they pause, like, it's fine, you know, it's okay. But a lot of times they're like, well, you know, we don't talk a lot. We, we don't, uh, I don't know, I see them every now and again. And uh, I just, I, I want a different relationship with my, with my kids. I really do. And I feel like this is the way to get it. And, uh, you know, I jotted down some notes here, but I'm going to kind of go off my notes for a second because there's, and I'm going to hit this in a different, in another episode where I've just got so many additional thoughts about this kind of gap between parents and children. But, uh, you know, I, I had an opportunity to go on a consulting gig to just, and it was kind of mind blowing and, uh, kind of can't talk about the details, but the data was just a, a phenomenal, the data that we saw. And what the data that I'm kind of talking about is, uh, and this is where I should have done a video of this, uh, of this episode just for this point alone. But, you know, if you kind of look at where you were, listener, with your parent growing up, the divide was not that, uh, was that, well, not that large. So, you know, I, I, my parents could tell me about their experiences and I still kind of could relate. I could relate. Yeah, sure, if I liked my music and they were telling me about the 50s and, you know, Elvis Presley. And I, so I know, I know that we get some wild music or that sort of thing. Or, or you know, I would be told that their eight track tape player was, uh, was a revolutionary. And I was thinking, well, you don't get it. I've got CDs, you know, and it's like we still were speaking pretty much the same language. You know, I still only had a few channels to choose from. Um, I mean, I still, uh, I, I just, I had to wait for things. I had to wait for next week for a TV show to occur. Um, even a TV dinner for the most part, I had to wait and, uh, and put it in the oven. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm like that crazy old. I remember getting a microwave, but, but I still had these kind of shared or similar experiences and the data, this consulting opportunity that I had where we were trying to figure out kids these days for the most part is that there, and here's what, here's what was pretty fascinating. The data that they showed had the, that technology is just increasing at such an alarming rate. And, uh, and again, I, before I was a therapist, I was in the technology industry for about a decade. I was in software. And they, they were kind of talking about this analogy of, and I remember this, when I was early in my software career, it, there was a year or two that it would take before the size of a hard drive would double or the, uh, you know, a microprocessor would double in speed. It would take quite a while. And they were showing this graph that now shows that uh, technology doubles now at just an alarming rate. And, the, and the, what they also showed was that the generations of kids these days is also increasing at, at that same kind of alarming rate. So no longer are we just kind of right there, you know, not, our kids aren't just kind of slightly askew of, uh, you know, running in parallel to us. They, they are going in a completely opposite direction. And, uh, and I'm not saying that from a, oh my gosh, what do we do? This is just, this was the data that was presented. It's just the facts. So now, you know, if I'm telling my kid that, well, I used to have to wait a week before the next episode, or I couldn't just door dash food to come to my, my place, or, you know, I couldn't just binge watch a whole season. It, my kids aren't hearing that and going, man, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible, dad. You know, that must have been really hard. And I think I want to do the same thing. You know, they're not saying, 
uh, season three of Stranger Things has came out. So I think I'm going to pace myself and watch uh, one episode every week. I mean, that's not the experience. The experience is I don't hear you, uh, you know, old man, um, and you don't understand me. And so I hear parents all the time say, well, I, well, I let my kid know I don't, I don't have social media, you know, or, and it's like, and it's not like the kid's going, man, that is, that is really cool, dad. I don't know how you do it. They're, they're like just, they just don't even hear. And, and this data kind of showed, and this is one of the epiphanies I had of where I feel like it wasn't that many years ago where somebody didn't want to do something. I don't want to go to college, you know, but if their parent was like, you're going to college, they were eventually like, eh, fine, I'll go to college. Well, now it's like, I don't want to go to college. And a parent's like, well, you know, I went to college and, and it was hard for me and I didn't know what I wanted to study. And I went through three majors and, you know, the kid isn't going, eh, I know I'm going to go to college. They're like, okay, I'm, I tuned you out. And, uh, and again, I'm not trying to say this. So it's like, let's get the pitchforks and let's rally and go get all the teenagers and round them up. It's like, what do we do with that data there? I mean, it's that concept of here's where we are. And so I feel like it's more important than ever to have this, a strength-based parenting platform or paradigm to, to try to be there with your kid, especially at the crossroads of their life. Um, because I did hear at one point that, you know, you kind of need to keep in mind that the fewer wedges that you, you could drive between your kids, the easier that it will be for them to come back, especially when they need you because they will want to come back to you. And this this goes across all kinds of uh, examples. I mean, one of the things I do a lot with are the concept of like faith journey, faith crisis. I work a lot with, um, you know, uh, churches that uh, have kind of more of like an all-encompassing belief system. And so people kind of uh, bump up into, against the walls of like their, their belief system. And, uh, and they're going to go figure things out on their own. And a lot of times the parents will kind of double down on orthodoxy. They'll say, look, you know, I think what you're doing is wrong. And I'll be over here when you finally realize that you're wrong. And, uh, and I'll tell you, that's part of what is kind of, again, driving the teens or driving the younger generation away. And, and especially in that scenario of uh, like in this religious context, though, because at some point, if they are really, if they are struggling or if they do kind of want to return to maybe their faith community or, or that sort of thing, it's, it's going to happen e- easier if they feel like they can go back to their parents. So and that's that concept of like the knowing their parent has been there for them or will be there for them, or there are fewer of these wedges that have been driven. So that was a lot longer of a buildup than I wanted to uh, have. But this is where I, this is why I feel things like the nurtured heart approach or even that love and logic that Becky talked about last week or the week before are so important. So I, I'm going to give a quick overview of the nurtured heart approach and uh, some, some more of the details. And, and I, I just want to be straight up front. I hope that uh, this is okay. I found you know, when my Google searching, uh, there's so much data on nurtured heart approach, but I found this really nice paper and it was, uh, it's called an integrated approach to a school-wide behavioral system, effectively combining, um, I think it's positive behavior systems and the nurtured heart approach. And it was by, uh, someone named Erin Brimmer. And, um, and it was part of what she, re- she submitted. It's out there on the internet as a requirement for uh, get, getting her master's degree in counselor education. And I did actually chase her down at a school district founder, sent her an email and said, Hey, uh, I'm going to use your um, your paper because it's really good, and I would and I just did hope to hear back from her, but I didn't. But so the 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 first part of this is coming from that that paper because what I loved it is it's a research paper and she has all of the references to the research within the paper. So she she says the nurtured heart approach is defined as a way of thinking with a set of strategies that are particularly useful for difficult or intense children, and this approach emphasizes the opportunity to energize crucial traits of a whole person while staying within the structure of clear and consistent boundaries. So if you're not familiar with the nurtured heart approach, there's the word that I think a lot of parents like, clear and consistent boundaries. But I love that concept of we're going to energize crucial traits of the whole person. And energizing crucial traits, we all come to the table with different traits. I mean, and part of it, this goes back to, it's, it's the, every kid is, has their own nature, nurture, birth order, abandonment, rejection, um, friendships, uh, you know, you, you name it. So they have their own individual traits. So we want to be able to energize these crucial traits of this whole person. The goal of the approach is to help children create a new lever, level of, and this is a phrase I use a lot too, inner wealth that will inspire them to make positive choices rather than negative choices. So it, she goes on to say, balance uh, with using strong positives and demonstrating excellent limit setting is a very important aspect of this approach. Um, this approach, uh, Glasser, Bo, uh, was Bowditch, and Bravo in 2013 found typical parenting methods were not working because negative behavior was accidentally being rewarded. I mean, that's the one where I just want that to just sit for a minute. I mean, how many times do we accidentally reward negative behavior? I mean, that's when we react. Reaction is rewarding negative behavior. 
So the Nurtured Heart approach is designed to help parents direct their attention in the right direction and to help uh, create greatness among their children. This is done through limiting the amount of attention given to negative or undesirable behaviors while recognizing even small positive behaviors, naming those behaviors, and placing a value to that occurrence. And by doing these things, parents are energizing their attention in a positive way toward their children's behaviors. So with the Nurtured Heart Approach, children with like serious emotional or behavioral disorders are referred, referred to as energy-challenged or intense children. And uh, according to, and there's a lot of names here in this part of the research, um, they assume that children have a greater need for social connection, relationship, and response, which creates the need for energized attention. So that energy that your child is putting out there, negative energy, positive energy, whatever it is, that is this need for attention. So much of the research regarding the Nurtured Heart Approach represents the parent training model, and, and it has its effectiveness within the home environment. And then she goes on to say, however, informal research has indicated this approach has value and effectively impacts children in a variety of settings, including Head Start programs, schools, foster care agencies, treatment centers, pre-adolescent diversion programs. So by using this nurtured heart approach, there's these basic strategies that are used. Um, they're called stands. So taking a stand and maintaining a belief in an unbending and courageous way. I love that that phrase, that as parents, we're going to have to maintain this belief in an unbending and courageous way. So this approach is centered around the stands or principles and are defined as being consistent, resolved, and committed to specific and targeted strategies. Strategies. Here's the stands. You're going to get very familiar with these today. The, the stands are as follows. Number one, refusing to energize negativity. And we are going to break that down. Number two, purposefully and relentlessly energizing success. That is, I mean, well, I was about to say, that is the key. But number one is the key too. And then number three, establishing and applying clear rules and genuine consequences. So there you go. Parents, we're going to have rules and consequences too. It's, we get the whole thing. So elements of behavioral and relational approaches are blended together to provide these stands and the explanation of the purpose. If change is the end goal, these three stands need to be the area of focus. Absolutely. So let's get into this. Nurtured heart stand number one. Refuse to, to energize negativity. So she says, and, and I'm going to stay on this paper for a minute, and I'm going to give my own, uh, my own thoughts here as well. So she says that this idea of refusing to energize negativity contradicts the conventional approach to parenting. Um, and that's according to the research that Glasser has. Um, typically, parents address rules and values through instruction, lessons, and lectures. How often do we do that, right? This, uh, I will lecture you. I need to teach you a lesson. Let me give you instruction. So oftentimes the lessons that are being taught, though, on the spot, uh, this on the spot correction of a negative behavior. So we're, we're trying to, when this negative behavior happens, now we're going to jump in and try to instruct, give a lesson or a lecture. So this behavior has led to a rule being broken or a child failing to demonstrate an important value of the family. So according to Glasser, this type of parenting in regards to the nurtured heart approach is known as energizing negativity. That is not what we want to do. Um, so again, he goes on to say, energizing negativity, parental energy, attention, and intensity is highlighted on the problematic behavior of the children. So that's, I mean, when we're, when we're pointing out and energizing the negativity, we're doing exactly the opposite of what is shown to be in research, the data shows, to be a more productive approach to not energize the negativity or more, more to, you know, reward positivity. So children with challenging behaviors are often left experiencing negativity and a sense of failure. This may result in damaged self-esteem and eroded self-confidence. The Nurtured Heart Approach takes the stand of refusing to energize negativity. Instead, it provides parents with the opportunity to explore the balance of negatives and positives in their parenting style. So again, you have to keep some things in mind. Here's me jumping in here with my thoughts. I did once hear at a training, this was from a child psychiatrist, that uh, a child's a kid, and I'll say kid and teen kind of interchangeably, but a kid's job is to push away from their parents. They, their job is to become independent. As a matter of fact, we want them to, to grow from the self-centered, uh, you know, maniacal young tot to a self-confident um, person. So that is that is their job. So they're going to be pushing away from us. They're going to be pushing back from us. That's expected. Um, I love this concept of where I really feel like uh, your job is to go from being a coach. You know, you are the coach on the sidelines of their lives to becoming more of this general manager who you know, you're, you're given, uh, you're given some advice or you're kind of setting, uh, trying to set them up to, to do as best as they can for you know, working with their own team. So think back to your childhood or your teen years. I mean, were you completely 100% open and honest about everything that you told your parents? I mean, I know I wasn't, uh, and my mom kind of thinks that I was, but that was, uh, that was part of the way kids work. I mean, you know, she's like, man, we talked about everything. 
And uh, let me, I mean, I hope my mom doesn't listen to this one, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, we, we talked about a lot, mom, uh, but there's a lot of things that you hold back. So, and this is a huge key in this not energizing negativity. Try your best not to take insults personally. Teenagers in particular, they gaslight by default. I mean, uh, but they, they, they sometimes come across as tiny little narcissists, but, uh, but they are not. Uh, that's, this is why I did an episode a while ago on different versions of gaslighting. A lot of their gaslighting comes because they know that they're in trouble or they feel like they've done wrong. And here's what that can look like. So, uh, all right, you know, you're, let's say your daughter walks in. Um, hey, uh, 15 minutes past curfew. Um, why didn't you call or text me? I thought we talked about that. And she says, well, I fell asleep. And then you kind of, you're trying to be nice, you're tiptoeing around it. You know, you, oh, okay, maybe in the future you could set an alarm. I mean, just in case you do. And then you hear, you know, she says, uh, dad, do you, do you think I'm meant to fall asleep? I mean, like, do you really want me to set, I'm gonna set an alarm on my friend's house so that the one time I fall asleep, but what, it'll maybe wake me up? Like, seriously, you want me to be, you know, setting an alarm every time. So like I'm watching a movie and all of a sudden my alarm goes off and I mean, that's just weird. Like you, you don't even get it, dad. Like I seriously can't believe you want me to just embarrass myself in front of my friends. You know, and all of a sudden you're as the parent, you're like, I mean, I don't want you to no, I don't want you to do that. Like that. No, that's, I mean, you're, you're fine. Okay. Good talk. Good night. I mean, that's not the goal, you know? So you try your best not to take any of these insults personally. So, and honestly, this is another reason, yet another reason why I think it's a, a good time to, if you haven't already done so, begin, find a meditative practice. Find your Zen moment. I'm a Headspace fan. Um, there's the Calm app. There's one called Humbly that uses music. Uh, you don't even have to do an app. You, you can um, go Google Leaves on a Stream Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Um, it's a it's a little meditation technique that's pretty impressive. Or you know, I'm a big fan at times of where it's uh, I'm just like breathing in. I count one, breathing out. I count two. Try to get to ten. You're, you'll be surprised how much your mind will wander. And when you realize that you're not counting again, then start over. Try to go back to it. I had somebody now tell me that they meditate just by sound. They love to just turn. You know, just um, just stop and just listen. And that's a that's a practice of meditation. So they take five minutes and they just listen to everything around them and they they note it. They point out the sounds. And the reason why you're doing that, it's not just about relaxation. What it's about is just being able to remain calm, keeping that heart rate down. Or if your mind is starting to go, oh my gosh, I can't believe this little snot. I'm going to, you know, it's like, okay, I'm kind of coming back to present or coming back to center. I'm not chasing those thoughts of that I need to react or I better show them. Um, and that reminded me, I did put in my notes, ponytail story. So I, I often, when I'm talking about mindfulness with a client, I will then say, you know, and then once you achieve Zen, you know, then we'll have the yoga mats and you get the, and I get the clip on ponytail and that makes people laugh because I'm bald. And so I thought I would said that to a client that I was working with and they had texted me and they just said, Hey, day, whatever of uh, mindfulness and meditation. And I just was, I just was like, well played. And then I just thought it would be funny real quick. I jumped onto Amazon and I looked for clip on ponytails. There's like, if you look up for a clip on ponytail, it's not what I anticipated it would be. That's a real thing in the women's hair care or women's accessories, I guess. So I found the one that I felt looked the best that maybe a guy could like put on there to be total zen with this clip on ponytail. And I just sent him a, a picture of a, or a link to a clip on ponytail and bless his heart. He replied back and he's like, um, Sorry, but I kind of don't really understand that. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to do some explaining. But you find your Zen moment. You get your yoga mat, your clip-on ponytail. You find this moment, this area of Zen, and you don't react because you're, you know, try your best not to take the insults personally. So you do not then react to that negativity. You just, you don't do it. And the, and the, here's the thing too. I remember the training I went to, they talked about the, almost called it this video game style of parenting. And I'll get to that more later too. But uh, the trainer said that they know your buttons. They know how to push your buttons. And, and guess what? You have more buttons than you think you do. So your job in this first stand of not energizing negativity is to hide your buttons. And they are going to push them and push them and push them. I mean, you know, oh, now you don't even care. You're not even going to react. You know, at, at least I thought you used to care. You're going to hear it all. And so you're, you're going to become the Zen master. And, and it does feel empowering. And it feels, you know, you feel more in control when you're not reacting to that, because it's like, okay, I, you know, I'll wait till you're done. And uh, what's fascinating is you literally are waiting till they're done, because then you have this opportunity to say, hey, I really appreciate the way that you uh, you calmed yourself down, because that kind of shows me that you're ready to talk. You know, there's a, there's a little preview of kind of the things that we're going to talk about. So let's uh, let's get to nurtured heart stand number two. This one is called energizing the positive. So again, stand one. I mean, we're not engaging the negative behavior. Stand two is where things start to get really fun. Um, nurtured heart stand to energize the positive 
instead of following the basically the conventional approach, which is focusing on negative behaviors in an effort to stop them. So the Nurtured Heart approach it encourages, it encourages the positive to be energized. Energizing success, and this is back to that uh, uh, that paper, energizing success creates positive relationship through the frequent positive interactions. So these positive interactions may happen when a child is demonstrating a want of behavior and the parent or the educator gives attention and praise due to the shown behavior. Energizing success may occur differently and the Nurtured Heart approach has four specific techniques. And these become very, very important, very empowering. Um, here's where a lot of the work comes in. So energizing success. All right, we've got active recognition. We've got experiential recognition. we got proactive recognition. And we got created re- creative recognition. We're going to go into all four of those. So let's start with active recognition. So active recognition, it's detailed descriptions of a child's behavior. So this is, it's specific. It's without judgment. It is strictly a factual observation. So this technique, it's often described similar to taking a photograph. So active recognition is basically a snapshot-like description of what's taking place. So they, they talk about active recognition, kind of calling them these Kodak moments. So it's an observation of facts, of, of what you see before you, and you are literally just providing a verbal snapshot, there's that Kodak moment, of the moment. So the recognition is given with no interpretation, no opinion. It is just the facts of the molecules of success. And it sends a message to the recipient, to the child, to the kid, to the teen, to anybody that you're doing this with, that I'm worth being noticed or I can do this because I'm doing it. And and this is big. It really is. And it's a place to start. I, I can't tell you how many teenagers I've worked with that truly have commented or feel like their parents don't even know that they exist or that their parents don't really acknowledge much of anything that they do. So starter ideas for active recognitions, it's basically I see you and then whatever the behavior is. Literally is, hey, I see you coming downstairs or look at you eating breakfast or I notice that you're doing your homework or you know, I, I hear you practicing your trumpet and that is active recognition. That's it. You're done. And, uh, and at first, especially if this isn't something that you do often, I think that you'll get that look from your kid of like, okay, and your point. But uh, that is not, uh, that's not our goal is to, to make this our new baseline paradigm, this parenting model. So active recognition is an easy one. It's like, hey, I see you coming downstairs or, um, you know, look who just came home, that sort of thing. So um, let's move on to number two. Number two is called experiential recognition. So experiential recognition is very similar to active recognition, but now now we're going to attach an emphasis on the, the value of the snapshot picture that was taken and described. So this provides the children with something to begin evaluating their experience or their behavior. So even though parents and educators are encouraged to make an effort to notice and mention and energize positive behaviors in which children are engaging in, sometimes... The, uh, the children really do show very few opportunities to be celebrated. And I think this is, and there's an episode that I'll link to in the show notes, and it's um, from Rachel Nielsen's 3 and 30 podcast, uh, Takeaways for Mom. Um, I did one of these, and I think she made the title very clever. It was something like how to praise your kids when there's, you feel like there's nothing really worth praising. And uh, so, again, you can, you can actively recognize. But then it's experiential recognition, and they call these Polaroid moments, so another camera analogy. Um, experiential recognition, it's an observation of both the facts that you see and also what that says about the person's greatness. So and let me jump really quick back to that active recognition. If I go back to that training that, uh, that I went to where the, the instructor kind of pointed me out, um, the active recognition would just be, look at you with your pen and paper ready to take notes. That's active recognition. And I really would have felt like, oh, she notices me. So then what she did was, though, she did this experiential recognition. She said, you know, she's like, oh, look at you with your pen and paper ready to take notes. Um, I can tell that you care a lot about your clients or that you want to be the best therapist you can be. So see, see what's different now about experiential recognition? So this technique, it, it sends messages of worth and it, and it starts to, what, uh, what they say, rewrite the child's portfolio of who they are based on your firsthand experiences of these character-focused successes. And so some starter ideas for experiential recognitions. Um, it's like, you know, I notice you or, you know, I notice you doing this or I appreciate you doing this or I want to honor that you are doing this or I want to celebrate you are doing this. So there's the active recognition. So, you know, hey, I see you playing with your brother. There we go. That's part A, uh, active recognition. Now, part B comes in, and and they kind of say that it's you're adding this character quality. So, part B says, and that shows that you are, or, you know, or that's evidence that you are, or, you know, I see you playing with your brother, which proves that you are, you know, such a good big brother who is going to teach him, you know, how to be, uh, 
um, on how to be a productive member of the family. Or, you know, I see you doing your homework, which shows me that you really care about your schoolwork or you really want to do well in the future. So it's that part A, active recognition. Part B, you're putting this character quality in there. So in that uh, training for me, I see you with your pen and paper ready to take notes. And that shows me that you want to help your clients the best way that you can. Active recognition, character quality, and I felt like a million dollars. So um, the, one of the handouts I have, uh, let me see, they had some examples. And I just want to give more of these. I think this really helps when a lot of people say, well, give me examples. Tell me what this looks like. So more examples of this experiential recognition. You know, this, this one says, Sarah, I noticed that you just looked irritated by that word problem. And yet you kept on working on it to, to completion, which shows that you are a, um, you know, a, a perseverant and diligent student. Or Josh, I see that you put your lunch money uh, form and your daily planner on the table for my signature. You're setting both of us up to be successful and getting out of the house tomorrow morning. And so we won't have to scramble to get those things done. Way to show responsibility and organization. And uh, so this is just really good. I mean, so I hope you can start to get the vibe. So we are not engaging in the negative. We're starting to do this active recognition, this experiential recognition. So let's go on to the third one of these um, active recognition techniques, which is proactive recognition which says uh, proactive recognition is a technique that encourages parents and educators to create environment for success so active and or experiential recognition can take place. So proactive recognition, they like to call these canon moments um, in the Nurtured Heart approach. So what is proactive recognition? It's an honoring and celebrating of the rules that have not been broken. How about that? Proactive recognition is a deliberate statement to identify the success of what isn't happening in a situation but could be. So this type of recognition is filled with empowerment and the child is fully given credit for the positive choices they meet, they made. And here's what I love about it. Even if they didn't know, even if they hadn't been deliberate in the decision. So rules are taught in this manner through a very firsthand experience of success. So this sends messages of power and control for both the current moment and to be used in the future. So some starter ideas for proactive recognition. So it's, um, you know, I see you not hitting your brother, even though you could be, which shows me that you are patient. So, I mean, they're, they're literally sitting there not hitting their brother and you're saying, look at you. I see that you're not hitting your brother. That really shows me that you're being patient. Let's say the little brothers, you know, I don't know, being annoying or making noises or that sort of thing. Or here's another example. You totally could have been hitting your brother and instead, um, you're sitting there watching TV and that proves that you are patient. So, you know, or, or here's another example to give, you know, you seem to be feeling frustrated and, uh, but you're still, yet yeah, you're still not uh, hitting your brother. I shouldn't be talking about hitting a brother so much. I mean, that's probably not the best example, but I think that you can see where I'm going with this. But it says that shows me how patient you are. Um, or let's say this one. Okay, I'm impressed that you're doing your homework instead of playing video games. That really takes self control to make that kind of choice. So there. So you see the kid and they are doing their homework. Even if they're frustrated, they don't want to do their homework. That, there's a better example. So it's like, man, you know, look at you doing your homework. And then it's like, I'm impressed that you're doing your homework instead of playing video games. That really takes a lot of, of um, that takes a, uh, a lot of discipline to make that kind of choice. So, I, and I hope you're just starting to pick up on this vibe. That's instead of walking by them and hoping, you know, I don't want to interrupt them because then they might stop doing their homework. We kind of have to get out of that mindset. We have to shift that mindset that we are, we are empowering them or we're building this inner wealth. So then they give some specific examples. And those, the ones that I just gave are ones that came up off the top of my head. But on this handout that I have, uh, here's examples of proactive recognition. It says, Catherine, I remember this one. Okay, Catherine, I just noticed that Sam walked past and bumped into you and you didn't get angry or shove him, but instead you just stepped away. What a powerful way to handle the way that you get to decide your own choices. That takes a lot of self-control and you have it. So that might be one where, um, you know, uh, Sam walks past Catherine, bumps her, bumps her, doesn't even really, she doesn't even really notice it, but this is where you are going out of your way. You're building this inner wealth. So let me read that one again. Catherine, I just noticed that Sam walked past you and bumped into you and you didn't even get angry or shove him, but instead you just stepped away. What a powerful way to handle the way that you get to decide your own choices. That takes a lot of self-control and you have it. Or here's another one. Uh, Steve, I know you don't particularly like my answer to the question you just asked, but I want to honor you for the maturity that you're showing and not rolling your eyes or being argumentative. So, you know, Steve might just be completely disengaged, but you're again telling him, I really appreciate the fact that you didn't roll your eyes, you weren't argumentative. And uh, so you're kind of uh, bringing that to their attention. Um, Another one, it says, Jane, look at the focus that you're using on that project right now. You aren't rushing or scribbling, but instead you're taking your time and showing off your amazing artistry. So the kid could just be sitting there coloring and, uh, and you are just, you're just building this inner wealth. 
So the last one is creative recognition. This one becomes a, this one's one that I, if I have a weak spot of these four, um, this one this one is definitely the case. Creative recognition involves using commands or providing specific requests for certain tasks to be completed. So these requests are followed by enthusiastic positive feedback. So if a child does not want to comply, the command needs to be strategically refocused. I love that word strategically. Strategically refocused on a task that would be preferred. So as compliance begins to be more prominent, the tasks become more complex, and this allows parents and educators to shape the desired behavior. So creative recognition, a method of creating success that may not otherwise exist. This technique starts with a clear and doable request or an action in progress, and then celebrates movement in the right direction, regardless of the intention or quantity of movement. Creative recognitions, and this is an awesome phrase, hijack children into success by lowering the rope and being very clear about where that rope is. It sends a message of clarity, ability, and the forward motion into new successes. So um, the starter ideas for creative recognition are these phrases like, hey, I need you to, or I want you to, or go ahead in, or it's time to. So it might be, uh, you know, hey, I see you getting ready to uh, go outside, or I see you um, getting ready to go outside, but now I need you to just quickly pick up your toys. Or it was, you know, I, w- I was going to ask you to pick up your toys and you already did it. That shows how you are thoughtful or that shows you how you are mature. So here we go. Here's the examples of creative recognition. So it says, um, hey, Robert, uh, I need you to come here. And you pause to see if he'll come here. And then it's, uh, and it says, hey, I want to honor you for looking up at me when you heard my words. I appreciate that you're moving in this direction and showing your respectfulness. So again, notice what we're doing there. Robert might have just looked up. Well, he wasn't even moving this way. Or it says, uh, Maya, it's time to finish the snack that you're eating so we can go. Then a pause. And uh, look, you kept chewing, which shows you're doing exactly what I asked. I appreciate how you're a team player and getting us out the door. That one's pretty brilliant, right? She's still chewing. She's probably not even, you know, that, that to her isn't necessarily taking action. So it's creative recognitions. So, so I just, uh, you know, I feel like those four techniques alone um, in, this, in this part two, which uh, again, um, you know, that first stance is you are going to not acknowledge the negative. And then in stand two, you're going to energize the positive, And then you're doing it through those four techniques, which is active recognition, experiential recognition, proactive recognition, and creative recognition. And uh, right there, you, get, you take those two things of, of not energizing the, or you know, kind of ignoring this negative, not energizing the negative, and then energizing the positive, and you are, uh, you're off and running. So let's get to... Um, nurtured heart stand three. So this one is provide and uphold a perfect level of limits. So, um, you know, and actually before I move on, let me just give, uh, I did another episode of nurtured heart with pastor Chris Young, who is a big virtual couch favorite. And on, he had me come to his, uh, uh summit Christian church. This was over a year ago and talk about nurtured heart approach, which I really appreciated. And it, Pastor Chris did his own homework, and he found an example that was just brilliant. And it was an example where um, it was in a, a pretty rough school, I believe is what he was saying, and a teacher was fully versed in the nurtured heart approach. So let's just say she looks at a kid, and we'll call him Stephen. Um, and she might have said, hey, Stephen, tell me what a dog says, for example. I forget the exact ex- uh, example. But he said, what does a dog say? And Stephen isn't going to answer at all. And Stephen's just kind of sitting there, and whether he's being just, uh, whether he wants to be angry or frustrated or whether he's been rude or maybe even has a, you know, a learning challenge, but Stephen just sits there. So then um, the teacher, let's just say, looks over at uh, I don't know, a girl, we'll call her Molly, and just says, hey, Molly, um, or it says, Stephen, do you mind if I ask Molly if she can help you answer this question? Again, Stephen's kind of just uh, looking at the teacher. And then she says, Molly, hey, can you, uh, can you be on Stephen's team and can you, tell, uh, can you guys tell us what a dog says? So then Molly says, hey, a dog says rough, rough, or that sort of thing. And so then the teacher says, man, Molly, thank you so much for sharing that. I can tell that you uh, were really paying attention. And then she turns to Stephen and says, Stephen, thank you so much for allowing me to, um, you know, put Molly on your team. And it just shows me that you uh, you care about uh, the class or, you know, I can see that you are willing to... um, work together as a team to get the answers. And I just didn't look at you guys did a great job providing the answer. So again, Steven's just kind of sitting there the whole time before you know it. Now he's received praise and, uh, and he, he most likely feels a little bit better. And then, you know, from that day forward, she can go back to, Hey, Steven, do you want, do you want to pick somebody on your team? Do you want me to do that? Or do you want to answer this next question? And so he's starting to kind of feel like he matters. And he, instead of getting the, you know, Stephen, fine, I'll sit here all day until you answer the question, you know, which I, I've heard those kind of examples as well. Well, I'm saying again, those aren't necessarily positive ones. They aren't positive ones. So let's go to Nurtured Heart Stand 3. 
And uh, this is where we'll kind of finish up today. Nurture Heart Stand 3. Okay, provide and uphold a perfect level of limits. So through the implementation of the previous two stands and the Nurture Heart approach, time and energy is shifted away from a child's negative behavior to, to the recognition of the positive behaviors the child is displaying. So these two stands pave the way for the third stand in which timely, simple, non-punitive consequences can be introduced. So communication with the child should take place in a neutral manner. Um, and, uh, and I really appreciate that. So it's trying to, again, at this point, you're not engaging. You're not engaging with the negative behavior, so you're not flipping out. You're not you know, getting freaked out because that is the, the, the kids knowing how to push your buttons. And our goal here is to learn to hide our buttons, um, put our buttons away. And uh, so communication with the child should take place in a neutral manner. And this approach suggests using a, and I like the word, they use this word a lot in Nurtured Heart Approach, a reset, a brief timeout for the child to regain self-control. And again, the key word here is brief. And this is where I like to go into some of my own um, thoughts about uh, timeouts, where I, I have I believe that uh, timeouts are never quite a place where the child goes. You know, they sit there and they figure out, man, I really let mom and dad down. I really t- I need to not do that again. But more, you know, I hear uh, teenagers in particular that they get very good at planning out their uh, how they'll never get caught again. You know, you're almost like, uh, and I'm joking with this next part, but the timeout creates, uh, you're beginning to create or sow the seeds of the criminal mastermind who will then learn how to, um, all right, what, what, was the, what happened there? You know, how will, I, how will I pull off the bank heist next time and not get caught? So the, the brief timeout for the child to re- regain self-control, and that's the one where if you disengage and you're not, you know, you're not freaking out as well, um, resetting can be very effective if the groundwork is already in place. Again, that's the key. So it's with the intention of helping children feel great about who they are. That's the whole nurtured heart approach, creating successes that would not otherwise exist and becoming adept at identifying what is right with the behaviors being observed. And parents and educators are encouraged to integrate these three stands of the nurtured heart approach. So here's, here's, uh, here's my interpretation. This is where I go with this as well. I, I feel that uh, remembering that your role now is to get away from being the punisher because, and I just feel like it is very difficult to be both the punisher and the builder of inner wealth. Because the, the child often, or the teenager, they often aren't quite sure where they stand. They're not quite sure if the punisher is, is coming into the door tonight or if it's the person who's going to build them up. And I, and I get to see that. I see that with uh, working with teenagers often of where they, I hear that. They're not quite sure which version of their dad is coming home. Or they're not quite sure which version of their mom that they'll get. And I understand that. As a parent of four, I understand that can be really hard. And so I, I, that's what I really appreciate about this. So I, I like to say, and here's perfect world, best case scenario. I always say that you pick a, you know, at some point you, you pick a time and you're going to have a family council, family home evening, family group meeting, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and, and again, I can't help but use a little bit of humor, but you get a nice scent of brownies in the air and, uh, you know, maybe you've had a good meal. You got uh, dessert going. Um, you know, if it's a family home evening, you, you might have a sing a little song, maybe do a, have a little prayer, that sort of thing. It doesn't have to be that formal. You can also just say, hey, let, I want to get together and talk about, um, let's just talk about the family. And so in a perfect world, you're going to have the, the, the kids, the teens, you're going to have them come up with the consequences to things. So, you know, one of the big ones right now is if somebody is talking back or if somebody doesn't get their homework done or if they don't do their chores, then what's the consequence? What should happen if somebody doesn't do that? And you get the suggestions. And so a lot of times I always like to say the kids will come up with far more worse uh, punishments than the adults would. You know, a kid might say, um, you know, no, no, uh, no TV for a month, you know, or no phones for a month. And you were maybe thinking, all right, maybe a day. So that's where you get to say, man, that is a, I really appreciate you, you bringing up that suggestion that shows me, so you're doing nurtured heart, that shows me that you really want, uh, you want to see the, some change in the family. I really appreciate that. Um, but I'm, man, I'm wondering if maybe we should, uh, we should just make it a day or we should make it 12 hours or that sort of thing. And here's the key, again, my interpretations of nurtured heart is you, uh, you know, don't make the punishments that you can't keep. I mean, that's one of the biggest things as a parent or working with parents where they'll say, okay, you don't get your phone for a week. And then they realize, oh boy, you know, now that's, uh, that's a little bit hard because now I, you know, I need to get, a, I need to communicate with my kid or that sort of thing. And, and you got to be pretty, well, no, not pretty. You need to be consistent with these. That's why you need to set the, I always feel like set the punishments um, or the consequences to be uh, in, in a, per, again, I, I shouldn't be stumbling over these words. I'm very confident about this approach. So I believe that you make it uh, pretty short to start with because that gives you, you know, all of a sudden now they've got their phone back and you get to say, 
all right, man, I appreciate how patient you were through that 12 hour period, or I appreciate how, uh, how, you know, difficult that must have been for you in that day that you didn't have your phone. And, uh, and I see that you're, you know, going to be more responsible now, or, you know, that, that sort of thing, because you want more time. You want them in the game. When the first training I went to, they called the nurtured heart approach, this video game parenting. What they meant by that was, uh, kids are used to playing video games. And in a video game, you've got this reset. If the character dies, and they were using Mario, so we don't have to go into any uh, of the more aggressive, violent, bloodier games, but uh, when Mario dies, what happens? He just drops right back on the board and he's playing again. And I like that approach to the video game parenting style. So if we are building inner wealth, if we're being able to be there for our kids, be positive and, uh, and be this person that is you know, doing these active recognitions, these experiential recognitions, creative recognitions, and if we're not being energized by the negative, then we want our kids in the game. That's why timeouts end up being very short because you know we a timeout is basically a reset. It's not a I want you to sit there and think about it and feel horrible. It's hey we need a little we need a little bit of a break and then when you come out of there I'm going to tell you hey I appreciate how you handled that timeout and uh, and now we're back in the game. So you make those consequences. I believe you know first offense it might be a little bit not very long. Then it's second offense might be a little bit longer. But uh, you make these consequences, things that, that they come up with in a perfect world, because that way you can put these consequences up on the refrig- uh, refrigerator. And so if they talk back to mom or they don't do their homework, then it's like, oh, man, buddy, you know, I am so sorry that, uh, but, you know, those consequences you made, which I love, say that you don't get your phone for the next, uh, you know, until tomorrow morning. And so I am so sorry that uh, that's probably going to be, that's going to be pretty rough. And, and they want to get mad, but it's like, oh, I can see you're pretty frustrated. And I would be too. I can understand that. Um, boy, I can't wait till you've, uh, you know, you've, you've kind of done that 12 hours and, and then, uh, cause I know you get it. I know that you know what happened that, that was wrong. And they're, again, they're going to keep firing back at you. Oh yeah, well, I didn't want to do this anyway. And that's that part now where you're not acknowledging the negative. You're not energizing the negative. So there's the, the, man, the nurtured heart approach in, in kind of a nutshell, probably a very large or long nutshell. I'm not quite sure how long this thing is gone. But so remember, crucial stand number one is I refuse to be drawn into accidentally energizing or rewarding ne- negativity. Uh, make the response f- uh, to acting out and rule breaking predictably boring. They, they're not going to be able to push your buttons and it gets to be so empowering over time. Crucial stand number two uh, is I will absolutely energize and nurture success. I mean, you, you are going to do it. Relentlessly, you will energize positivity. Um, Use the approach's four techniques to find uh, and verbally comment upon successes, small and large, in between. And then crucial stand number three, clearly but unenergetically enforced limits. Uh, So here are the rules. Here's what happens when you choose to break the rule. And uh, I refuse not to provide a true consequence when a rule is broken. I will be absolutely clear with my expectations. And it is not a dangling carrot, but a reminder with very clear limits. Let me just say one more thing before I end, and I hope that uh, if you're listening, um, especially couples that are involved in this, here's where I feel like it is so important to have a parenting platform, a parenting paradigm. It's so important for the two of you to be coming from the same place when it comes to parenting because there are going to be times where one of you is just more frustrated with the other one. That's, the, that's just going to happen. You might be frustrated at work. You might be sick. You might not have enough sleep. Um, you might just not be in the best place. And so it is going to be hard for you to not... Uh, show your buttons, or it's going to be hard for you to not react at times. And this is where it becomes absolutely imperative to have a partner who can come and just give you a gentle touch on the shoulder, uh, just a gentle touch on the elbow. And I call it just the tap out. And my wife and I have tapped each other out on many occasions. And the key to the tap out is you must have an agreement between you and your spouse. When that tap out comes, you, even if you don't feel like you are being unreasonable, you trust your trust your partner. And just, you know, if they're, hey, I got this. It's like, okay, hey, thanks. Walk into the other room, do a little bit of breathing. And then when your partner comes in, you know, this is where you need to be humble. You need to be empathetic. You know, you need to start with that by saying, hey, I, I, my, I didn't even see what I was doing. So thank you for tapping me out. Help me, help me understand. You're showing me my blind spots. And that might be where, well, you were starting to raise your voice. And, and I just wanted to, to kind of, you know, keep things mellow or that sort of thing. And so when you look at that as we're in this together, it is incredibly empowering. It truly is. And sometimes even just that when your spouse walks in, you know, just that's enough of a presence as you get really good at this of just to, to kind of calm down. It's like, okay, you know, I recognize I'm kind of getting out of hand. Uh, There are also some pretty important things here where it is 100% fine to apologize to your kid. I can't believe the number of parents I talk with at times who feel like, 
If I apologize, I'll show weakness. And it is, it is the exact opposite. If you apologize, you show that you're human. So when, when parents will get mad, lose their temper, maybe yell at their kids, and then they come back and they, they're like, well, I can't apologize. They'll think I'm weak. It's like, what, you know, what story is that that your brain's trying to hook you to? Uh, just say, hey, I, I really am sorry. I didn't mean to do that. And uh, that's the part where I know from my own teenagers, I know from talking with teenagers, I know from talking with parents who, have, uh, who their parents didn't handle that part well, that there is no, I've never met a teenager or anyone who has said, yeah, when my parent apologized to me, then I knew I had them. You know, then I knew that they were weak. No, there's none of that. I get to hear plenty of things where I get to hear teenagers say, my parent never apologizes. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. You know, they expect me to apologize to my sibling or to them, but I, I never hear them do it. Even when, you know, I know and they both, we both know that they, they've done something wrong or something that they shouldn't have. So I think it's very important for a parent to make sure they apologize as well. So I hope there was no shame, glitter sprinkled on you right now. Um, no, you know, that sort of thing. Because the nurtured heart approach and having a parenting paradigm is incredible. It is incredibly powerful and it is incredibly empowering. And, uh, and if you're a parent right now that's saying, okay, well, I think that sounds weak and soft and ridiculous and I'll continue to, you know, uh, yell at my kid when I want to, well, you know, listen to this one again and do me a favor or go do, read some research on the nurtured heart approach. And if, uh, you know, if you go to your kids and say, Hey, you guys don't mind me yelling at you, right? What do you think your kid's going to say? They're going to say, no, 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 it's fine. Cause they're scared. Um, and this is, I, I can just, I can testify 100% to you that this is an incredible way to parent. Um, it's not without uh, frustrations. There are plenty of them. But the relationship that you build with your kids is incredible. And it's not that they're going to run all over you. It's that uh, the bottom line is, quite frankly, your kids are going to eventually do the things that they feel are right to do. And the question is, are they going to even be, feel like they can come to you for advice? Or if they can even come to you just to, to, to just talk things through and uh, do you want a relationship with your kids down the road? Do you want, uh, and now i got to make a joke, right? Um, do you want them to choose a, a good nursing home for you? This, the nurtured heart approach can truly be the key, and, uh, and I'm pretty confident of that. So, hey, I, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this episode today. I know it was probably a little bit long, maybe a little bit long-winded, but I'm really passionate about this concept of the nurtured heart approach. And uh, I've watched it change lives. I've, uh, it's changed my own life as far as the way that I parent and even the way that I interact with people in general. And, uh, and I've been doing this for a long time now. And this isn't one of those things where I have someone say, man, I really embrace the nurtured heart approach fully. And uh, boy, we're, it just broke everything, you know, in a bad way. No, nope, never heard that one. But I've heard plenty of the ones that people that say that as they slowly even uh, implement the nurtured heart approach in their parenting, that they start to see results and get changes. But I will 100% tell you that it is not something that is just easily done overnight that it is, it is frustrating. You'll even have times where your kids will pick up on this and, uh, and they'll even say, hey, I thought you were supposed to say nice things to me. And you know, guess what? You go back to that nurtured heart approach, uh, stand number one. You're not going to energize the negative behavior. You're not going to let them push your buttons. So, um, but I will, uh, I will stop right now. I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope that this makes sense. Share this with anybody that you think it might help. And uh, stop by TonyOverbay.com. Sign up for, uh, to find out about some uh, exciting things that are coming up now. Um, in the time that I recorded the first part of this and the second part, the book that I've uh, that I just finished is now available on Amazon. So uh, go go check it out. Um, he's a porn addict now. What a an expert and a former addict to answer all of your questions. That's by me and uh, co-author Josh Shea. And I really appreciate the support. I'm grateful for uh, how wonderful the response has been to the podcast. That's led to a lot of the wonderful things that I'm getting to do now. And so please rate, like, share, subscribe, all those wonderful things. And I'll see you next time on the Virtual Couch. Flying past Our heads and out the other end The pressures of the daily grind It's wonderful Elastic waste and rubber ghost I'm floating past the midnight hour They push aside the things that matter most It's wonderful Bus.